Okay, we don't have any attendees yet. We'll give them about five minutes and then we'll just go. Okay. Good afternoon. This is um, Nikisha Paul from the Black Women's Health Imperative. Welcome to our third and fourth series in our Tips and Tools for Nonprofit Sustainability Web webinar series. So in this final webinar series, we will cover two topics, budget management and brand visibility. Participants will learn tools, techniques on nonprofit budgeting. <laughs> Restricted versus non-restricted revenue streams, software for efficient recording, keeping and best practices on financial reporting to funders, as well as best practices on marketing your nonprofit organization to gain brand visibility using traditional tools and social media platforms. This webinar series has been hosted by Edith Love. Um, Edith Love is with E and E.L. and Associates. She has a vast background in nonprofit management from working with the NFL and securing $4 million um, for capital projects and endowment campaigns. She's managed $6 million in NFL grant funded initiatives. She's also worked with the Third Good Marshall College Fund, where she managed a donor portfolio of 300 corporate and government accounts, and she's raised nearly $3 million during her tenure at that time. She earned an executive MBA from Emory University, an MA for Clark Atlanta University in Public Admin, and a BS degree from Texas Southern University in Public Affairs. So as you see, she's well versed in nonprofit capital management, fundraising, and board governance altogether. So without further delay, um, we bring you our um, presenter for today, Eat of Love of EL and Associates. Thank you so much, Nakisha. Hello, everyone. So glad to uh, have you participate in today's webinar. As Nakisha stated, this webinar series is going to cover two key topics. So today's webinar will be an hour and a half, as opposed to the previous one hour webinars that we've been doing over the past. Um, Fridays. We will allow uh, some time for you all to ask any questions at the end of the series. So uh, technically, we can run until 145, but the official content and presentation that I will be delivering today will end at 130. So um, I have decided that I would talk about the budget management and reporting piece first. Um, at the top of this webinar, and then lead the brand visibility uh, topic for the last uh, portion of the time that we have allowed it for today. So let's get started. I want to make sure that I share with you, first of all, that this particular session that's that we're going to cover on budget management and reporting is really going to uh, provide you all with best practices on nonprofit budgeting and reporting. This is not an accounting type of uh, session. I am not a CPA. I am uh, very familiar on how to uh, manage financial um, um, revenue and, and expenses is coming in and putting together very extensive extensive budgets. But everyone, um, every nonprofit should have a CPA or a chief financial officer that actually 
puts together the budget and a accounting software and allow you guys to produce reports. This particular budget management um, series is going, content is going to cover on how to effectively manage your nonprofit budgets and the types of reporting you need to stay uh, in compliance with IRS and also to provide to your donors and other stakeholders. So again, this is on understanding budget management. We're also going to cover in this uh, session uh, some information about restricted versus non-restricted revenue. That is uh, something that exists in the nonprofit world. Uh, you, you, nonprofit revenue streams will always fall into two or three categories, restricted or non-restricted. But there's also another category that's called temporarily unrestricted. And I'm not quite sure if uh, the revenue streams that you have coming in your organization falls into that category, but I still want to provide you with some insight on what that entails as well. And then finally, we're going to talk about some of the software that you need to have an efficient financial management system in place so you can produce reports, whether it's reports to your board, to stakeholder holders, to the IRS, or to even um, prepare for a grant proposal. Every grant proposal requires you to submit some type of financial statements. So that's what we're going to talk about as it relates to the budget management and reporting session of this um, webinar. So let's get started. Um, nonprofits have pretty much operate two businesses in one. One aspect of your business is on the program and service delivery side. The other piece is on the fundraising operation side. All of this is critical to how you manage the funds from both ends of those two types of business operations. So some of the best practices around what needs to be in place to really have an effective management system in place. I've listed a few of the best practices that I think are the most common and the most key types of best practices. The first one talks about having an approved annual budget. The staff of the organization actually puts together the budget, whether that's the CEO or the executive director or the president. I use those terms interchangeably because every nonprofit has a different title for the top leadership of the organization. Some say CEO and president, some say executive director. But usually the top leadership of the organization uh, puts together, they develop the budget. But your budget has to be approved by your board of directors. So you have to have an approved annual budget. Also, it is good practice for organizations to try to get their budget approved um, before the beginning of your fiscal year. You want to take the time to really go through your budget, look at the previous year, look at the certain circumstances of your service delivery side, as well as your fundraising operation side, it realistically come up with all the costs and the expenses around those two types of operations that usually nonprofits function under. So taking the time to get together with your leadership team to really uh, put together a budget in advance before you submit it to your board of directors for approval. And then another best practice talks about having sound financial management. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but part of having sound financial management comes from making sure that the budget that you have put in place, you are executing those expenses accordingly and that you have the justification around what those expenses were for. Again, this is key as you go back to submitting your grant reports to your donors and providing uh, the, the information for your annual report, which we'll talk about a little bit more as well. But sound finance management is key. And uh, being able to prepare for those uh, unexpected types of challenges. For example, if you're operating a nonprofit organization 
<clears throat> and for instance, it's a, let's just use, for instance, a after school program. So you're running a full fledged after school program and you're getting funding from various uh, donors to support your after school program. And let's say you have a particular STEM initiative within your after school program. So this is a special program for students that are focusing in the STEM fields, which is the science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So you have a major funder that specifically supports the programming around this particular initiative. And for whatever reason, they tell you, this year we're not going to fund you. Now you've already prepared your budget. You've already expecting that revenue to come in. And now you're looking at, wow, we will not get any additional funding after this quarter. So mid, mid year, they're, they're informing you that they will no longer be able to fund your project for the remaining of the year. So you have to go back and look at your budget and make the right financial decision to how you're going to find the additional resources to support this particular project or where else would you have, and, and looking at your budget to see where can you pull some funding so that if nothing else, you can continue the program, which also gives you time to identify other uh, funding sources. So again, being able to uh, make the sound financial management decisions around your budget is an ongoing process within the budget management um, phase. So I just wanted to kind of emphasize that. And I like to use examples because everyone's interpretation could be slightly different from a particular best practice. So I always try to give examples to explain to you what I mean by um, a particular uh, best practice. The next one talks about effective finance executive committee. Every nonprofit board should have all functioning committees, but your executive committee or your finance committee you know, it depends on your organization. Some boards call it finance committee. Some boards call it executive committee. That is the committee that uh, helps also with the governance of the financial management of the organization. So when you submit your board re monthly reports to your board at your meetings, you have to explain your decision around the expenses and what you're anticipating for revenue and how you're anticipating on growing your revenue. So your your every nonprofit board needs to have a really good functioning finance committee on their board. Along with that comes accountability. Accountability is very key across the board. It pretty much uh helps with your credibility overall whether it's in the fundraising world, whether it's in the service delivery world, no one wants to give funding to an organization that doesn't have good financial management practices. And there should be some accountability within the organization for all those particular individuals that play a role in the financial management process. So accountability is key. Your reputation depends on it. Your ability to be able to effectively fundraise depends on it. And overall, the sustainability of your organization depends on it. So everybody should be held accountable for their, their decision making within the organization as it relates to the financial management. Okay, audited financial statements annual reports and your form 990. This is standard across the board and this is something that you should produce annually uh, for your organization. Um, you are responsible to report uh, these this to the outside parties and um, it is critical because your stakeholders and the public at large needs to have access to this. Nonprofit organizations uh, information is public. I know people don't want to remember that, but your financial information is public. And you have a responsibility annually to produce audited financial statements, to produce an annual report, 
and a Form 990, not just to the IRS, but also to your stakeholders and provide it through the various public uh, platforms that, that, that you can really look up an organization and look at their 990. And I share this with you and I wanna emphasize this piece because a lot of grant making organizations have started to look at an organization's 990 to determine whether or not they even want to fund them. Your 990 pretty much gives them an idea on how you effectively manage your finances. That's pretty much what it is. The annual report is something you give to your stakeholders that talks about where all the money, the, the different programs and resources, how you use the resources within the organization and which type of programs and where that they're pretty much where did their dollars go? Um, how did you spend their particular dollars that they donated to your organization? But also some grant making organizations also request annual reports when you submit a particular proposal. So again, this is a very key best practice. So understand that this is three statements that you just have to produce. And you should have your chief financial officer and your, the leadership of your organization working with an uh, uh, independent auditor to be able to pull this together. And sometimes you get the your board also has a responsibility to make sure that these financial statements are in place. Now let's talk about the next one. Review budget periodically throughout the year and revised as needed. As I was giving you an example previously, you may have secured funding. It's been pretty stable over the past three or five years. And then all of a sudden someone says, hey, we're no longer gonna be able to fund you. That is why it's critically important for nonprofits throughout the year to revisit the budget, make adjustments as needed, because that's just the way the world works. Nothing is never ever edged in stone. You always have to prepare. So to be able to know that um, you have a system in place where you're periodically reviewing your finances, looking at your budget, making adjustments, that's critical. So that needs to be a routine process. You can do it quarterly or you can do it as needed but it needs to be some type of system in place where the top leadership of the organization the key people that are involved in the budget management process reviews the budget on a periodic basis just to make sure that um, you are pretty much operating at a pace where you're not falling behind financially and you're preparing for any you know, major gifts that may come into the organization. So it works both ways. And another best practice is on good budget reporting and tracking. This is so key. In your budget management process, you have to be able to have good reporting and tracking because it helps you stay on task and it helps you to be able to effectively manage the finances of the organization. So just having the budget and a spreadsheet is one thing, but being able to have the right processes and systems in place to pull the reports as you need them and being able to track the expenses is equally important. You never know when a funder will be contacting you to say, hey, I need for you to submit to me the expenses from this grant. I need to have an, a detailed budget narrative on what you spent um, and how you use these particular dollars. And they have every right to request that. So that's why it's always good to make sure you have an annual report because if they've been a donor and you just got them on board as a donor, you kind of go over with them, okay, just so you know, we also put together an annual report which will provide you with a comprehensive look at how we use the funding throughout the year and what programs and um, services were, were delivered as it relates to your contribution to the organization. So we will be providing this annual report at the end of our fiscal year. And that fiscal year could be whatever your fiscal year time is. If you're not on a calendar year from January to December, your fiscal year, 
it's at the end of your fiscal year. If they already know that that report is coming, they might not call you on the spur of the moment and ask you to provide them with the budget report on, you know, your your expenses. Okay, so these are some key best practices. Like I said, and I think uh, this is a good list. There are several other best practices, and at the end of this presentation, you'll see a reference slide um with a list of websites you can go to to get some mater uh, additional material as well as some of the material i extracted to prepare this presentation so again these are just some key best practices that i think um is a good list for you all to start off with and to keep in mind as you begin to start uh developing your budget management process um within your organization Okay, now let's talk about how that process looks. How does the financial management process of the organization looks? What does it all entail? The financial management, budget management process, both terms are used interchangeably. That really entails three key components. The governance, which is the board of directors, the planning and the monitoring. And within that, you have what we call the operations. So operations is what is the actual processes and systems in place to make sure you have an effective budget management process. It has to have governance, it has to have planning, and it has to be monitored. And we're gonna go through all of these different components as we go through the slides. But I wanted to kind of give you a visual of how this looks within your organization. So within the center, you have your operations, your day-to-day -day operations. All of it falls back under the money you spend. In order to be able to have these operations, you have to spend money. You have revenue coming in and you have expenses. So your operations and how you manage your operations and the funding you use to operate on a day-to-day -day basis all centers around the people that are involved in executing this the process as well as the technology so the people are responsible for the implementation of these operations and the decision making around these expenses the technologies which you use to be able to manage the processes and systems you have in place up for these uh, for your financial management operations. And then the process, that's the process of you know how you go about putting together the financial management. Do you submit financial reports weekly, monthly? Uh, how are you? and the different types of processes you have in place, whether it's the CEO is the person that provides the budget reports, you sit down with the program person, this is your budget, you have $50,000 to spend this year on after school, you have another $50,000 to, um, to actually uh, spend on the, um, I'm sorry, I lost my training thought, pardon me. Oh, and you have another $50,000 to maybe spend on cultural arts programming. So again, this is very critical to the overall financial management process of your organization. Um, also, you have to also understand that with the technology, that's pretty much mean the reporting process so what systems what actual software systems are you using to do your reporting whether it's excel or quickbooks and we're going to talk a lot more about that shortly but i just wanted to um actually walk you all through this because this is very critical and i wanted to you all to see this visual piece so you can see how it all comes together as we walk through the, um, the other slides. Okay.
All right, next. Okay, so let's walk through the budget process and so we can see what all that means. Okay, the first, and what I've decided to do, the ones that are highlighted in green, I'm going to go over those more in depth. The others, I'm just going to walk through real quickly because they're pretty plain and simple. I mean, it speaks for exactly what it says. So I'm going to actually, um, you know, actually walk you all through the different ones. Okay, the first one is, um, the actual first one is determining a timeline. You want to, when you get ready to start preparing your budget, you want to make sure that you determine your timeline. And that pretty much means what I spoke about earlier. If you're coming toward the end of your fiscal year, you want to make sure that you allow enough time for the leadership within your organization and all those people that are involved in the budget process. You want to make sure you allow enough time for them to pull all their reports, to look at what they've spent within the year, especially people that work in your programs, your program managers, your program directors, whoever's responsible for the programmatic piece. And that may be several people within your organization, depending on how large your nonprofit is. So if you're working at a boys and girls club and there are several project managers, program managers, these people are responsible for executing the program, but they also have to work within a budget. They can specifically tell you directly, oh, we really didn't spend that much this year on this, or we really didn't, uh, we really do need to build capacity in this area. So we might need to identify other revenue streams to support this particular project. Uh, so you want to be able to put together a timeline, sit down with your team and say, hey, it is imperative that um, you all, um, it is imperative that you all allow enough time to work out exactly what specifically are some challenges with the current budget. So as we prepare for the new budget, you can understand that process and, and you have the timeline. So I'm giving my project managers, you know, two weeks to look at, review, and then you all come together. So being able to give them that timeline. Secondly is agreeing on goals. You have to agree on the goals and be able to um, decide on what the overall budget goals are for the organization. Again, brings me back to my point when I shared with you all the specific, the specific program expectations or goals. So if you're saying, hey, we really didn't, we really have increased capacity in this particular program, we're really going to need to see if we can find additional funding or we're not going to be able to serve as many kids next year. So being able to agree on what the key goals are as it relates to what your financial needs are for the organization. And then, of course, understanding the current financial status um, is critically important as well. And that needs to be something that's transparent. That doesn't need to be something that's if you have if you are if you have people within your organization are responsible for executing certain budgets for the program delivery of the organization it is critically critically important for you all to make sure that you're completely transparent about the current financial status of the organization if you've lost funding you need to be very um candid and and, and, and transparent to share that so you all can prepare how you all are going to replace that funding within the next year and working with your development uh, department to understand that you have to uh, find additional funding to support this particular shortfall. So again, understanding the financial status and then deciding on a budget approach. I'll walk you all through that next. And then developing a draft expense budget, that's critical, as well as developing a draft income budget, that's also critical. Uh, then there, you have to review your draft. And then, of course, the budget, as I stated earlier, when we walk through the best practices, the budget has to be approved. 
And then you document your budget decisions and then you implement the budget. So what I would like to do is I need to take a one second break because I really I'm thirsty. I, I really have to get some water. If you could just bear with me for one minute while I go and uh, grab a bottle of water, I would really appreciate it. I apologize, but I can't. <clears throat> I'm, I really need to have a drink of water. So bear with me for one second. Look at this slide. Decide on a budget approach. Look at it. Read the uh, bullet points and I'll be back shortly. Thank you. Okay, thank you all so much for your patience. So when we talk about decide on a budget approach, we're talking about assigning roles and responsibilities. And I mentioned that a few minutes ago as it relates to who's responsible for developing the budget and being able to assign program managers or staff on their particular role in developing the budget. So this could be the CEO president, the chief financial officer, the chief operating officer. That's what I mean when I say assigning roles and responsibilities. Bullet two talks about agreeing on authority to make decisions. And again, that could be the CEO, the president, the executive director, all of the above. That is critically important. So you want to make sure that the people that are making the decisions are fully aware of what the budget entails, the revenue, the expenses, and any justification on any changes, or if, if there are any deficits or potential deficits. <clears throat> you need to make sure that the people that are in the position to make those decisions or have the authority to make those decisions um, or providing the, the staff and, and all those people that are responsible for the effective execution of the budget, those things are in place in that they can agree on the authority to make those decisions. And then agree on how much uncertainty should be included. There are a lot of unknowns with nonprofit budgets as I shared with you, because nonprofits depend on funding from donors and stakeholders, you just never know if you're going to get funding or if funding is going to be renewed. So it is very important to um, plan in your budget what type, how much uncertainty you want to include in that. That's going to be very important. Okay, so that's what we mean when we say decide on a budget approach. The next one talks about developing a draft expense budget. 
<clears throat> excuse me. And that means to, you know, pretty much just determine the cost and the expenses to reach your program goals. Every program has a cost to it. And you need to be very clear on what those expenses are. So as you develop your budget, it is as realistic as it could possibly be. Um, and you got to project for any increase in services, whether it's you're serving more people uh, than you anticipated, you know, plan for that increase because um, having a realistic budget of what the expenses are it's going to really help in the end, at the end of the year, it's gonna probably help you see, you know, how well you pro you projected what those expenses would be. And it could also see if ultimately you can have a, um, an actual surplus if you budget very well. So being able to determine what the costs are of the expense and then determine what the cost is to reach your organizational strategic goals. We talked about the goals on the previous slide. You have to be clear on what your operating goals are for that year as it relates to your budget. And um, as it relates to your budget, so you need to be able to note that these goals are very or the organizational strategic goals and your budget is being developed within those particular strategic goals of the organization. So for instance, if the organization is looking at developing or, or, or building a new facility, well, we know that that entails a capital campaign. You need to be able to budget what expenses you're going to incur to actually be able to put together a capital campaign. If you're going to use consultants, you need to factor in the cost of what it would take to bring in consultants to help you raise funds to build a new facility. So those types of things, but that should be a part of your strategic goals. So that's like one of your strategic goals for the organization. And it's over the next two or three years. That's something that has to be factored into your budget until that particular project has uh, been completed. So those are the types of things we're talking about. We're saying developing your, your expense. And we're saying drafts because, again, this is the planning process. And of course, you talk when we talk about income budget, we're speaking about um, those, those determine the cost to reach. OK. Again, the income piece is. OK, that's a typo, but it really is to determine what income and expenses are coming in to reach your goal. And that would be what revenue is coming in, whether you're getting additional grants. If you actually have a budget where you are bringing in one point five million dollars in grants. Special events, annual campaign, those types of things need to be cleared. So that's what this means, and I apologize for that typo, but this, this area is speaking about the income coming in. But again, it's the same process. So you, you draft what the projected income will be, and then you put that in two categories. This is what we are currently getting. We know that this will be renewed for this coming year. This is where we fall short. We know we got to identify new revenue streams to support uh, this short, this 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 shortfall that we're going to incur, incur, then you share that with the development department. Well, we're going to have to raise an additional three hundred thousand dollars this year because this is the last year for this particular grant. So we want to make sure that we start planning and preparing to see how we're going to bring in the additional three hundred k. So that's what they mean when they say determining what the income will be projecting to see what uh, additional revenue you need to secure and then put together your development strategy to go and secure that revenue. That's all a part of the budget planning process. And you're going to review your draft. And when in this particular area, you want to verify that the draft meets the program and the organizational goals. You also want to review and discuss all the assumptions. And you also want to make adjustments based on goals and capacity um, matching the income and expenses. 
and you want to review the final draft for all the goals and objectives. So let's talk a little bit about um, reviewing and discussing all assumptions. When you get with this key team, and that's the people within your organization, whether it's the CEO and the CFO of the CEO, and maybe a program director and your development people. When you get with this mean these this is the people that are helping you plan this budget when you get with this team you want to review and discuss all the assumptions again you're developing your budget you want to review and discuss all the assumptions and you want to be very realistic about what those assumptions are and again you need these key people at the table because the program people are going to be realistic and say to you you know what last year we served this number in this category in this number in that category and we really need you know to identify additional funding to support this particular uh program area or you know what we may need to discontinue this particular program because it kind of overlaps with another program and we could pretty much serve the same um students or constituents just through this one program so maybe we can scale back those are the types of discussions you have during this particular process. And you make the adjustments um, accordingly, whether it's adjustments on the income side or adjustments on the expense side. You make the adjustments accordingly. And then, of course, you do the final draft of all the goals and objectives, and then you start to put together the actual proposed, I mean, budget. It is very important to make sure that you document all your budget decisions. This is required anyway in all your financial statements. When you produce those three key statements I shared with you earlier, your audit, when you do your audit, an auditor is going to come in and he's going to say, hey, I saw that you, you, transferred 100k from this account to that account for this program can you explain the justification for that so you want to make sure that you have all those types of things any type of budget decisions you want to make sure that they're documented this is pretty much the role of your cfo or your your finance director whoever oversees the financial management of your organization who is responsible for putting together the accountant in your organization this is pretty much their role. And you want to make sure that you have those budget decisions documented because when you present your budget to your board of directors, particularly your finance committee, they have to be OK with this. So the explanations and any decisions around this is equally important. OK. And then you want to write down all your assumptions. Um, hey, we got together. These are some things we're assuming. We're assuming that because Walmart cut back on their, their foundation giving or they changed their foundation giving focus, they might not necessarily fund us for the remaining of this year or next year because you're working on the budget for the upcoming year. So let's let's look at, let's make some assumptions on what we need to have in place, what strategy we need to have in place to supplement this this potential loss of a major donor so those are the types of things you want to make sure that it's incorporated in your budget uh process and this could be done in excel quickbooks whatever software you're using but the most important thing is to make sure that it is documented okay and then of course you want to implement your budget you want to assign the management responsibilities, <clears throat> your program person, your coordinator, whomever is responsible for the management of the budget. And within nonprofits, depending on the size, you may have several budgets. You have restricted budgets and unrestricted budgets. You have program budgets. It's, again, it's within your particular uh, nonprofit and how you all operate in your particular structure. But you need to make sure that you're assigned the management responsibilities. And again, here's where that accountability comes in. And you want to make sure that you hold those particular individuals accountable for managing the budget the way that they see that it, it was put in place. 
So if your after school coordinator has a budget of $25,000 for the year and she goes and she spends $35,000, that's an issue. Without approval, that's an issue. So again, these types of things have to be in place. And then you want to incorporate an accounting system, which we talked about that early, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's a part of implementing your budget. Uh, and then you want to monitor and respond to changes as needed. That's very important. And we talked about that earlier. And you will hear some of these things over because it's all a part of budget management. And it is very, every aspect of this is extremely important because your nonprofit credibility hinges on how well you manage it, manage your, fin your finances of your organization. So the budget management piece is important. Okay. Let's talk about revenue streams. Now we know not all money is created equal, especially in the nonprofit world. So part of being a nonprofit is being able to understand that um, you have an accountability to your donors. And um, if donors ask that their contribution be used for a particular program, you have to honor that. That's called being a good steward of the money that you have received. So that's what I mean when I say not all money is equal, especially in the nonprofit sector. And what that means is that um, nonprofits typically have what we call three different types of revenue streams. You have unrestricted, which we all love. You have temporarily unrestricted, which a lot of nonprofits, most of the smaller nonprofits might not necessarily experience. But large nonprofits like your American Red Cross, like your Cancer Society, a lot of those nonprofits do come across a lot of temporarily unrestricted funding. But more your small grassroots community based nonprofits typically probably don't get a lot of the temporarily unrestricted funds. And then you have restricted funding. So let's talk a little bit about unrestricted. And we pretty much know what unrestricted funds are. It's plain and simple. These are items that have no donor imposed restrictions. We love this type of funding. If a donor gives you funding and he says or she says, use it for general operating, that's always a plus plus for any organization. And I strongly advise nonprofits, if you want to truly reach work towards sustainability, we talked about that. Um, on last week's webinar, you got to start looking at generating grant funds that offer general operating support. Your general operating support is telling you, hey, I'm going to support your organization. I wanted to go towards your general operating dollars, whatever you choose to do with that, as long as it reports the overall operations. That's always good. That's kind of unrestricted revenue. Um, then we're talking about temporarily unrestricted revenue. Let's talk a little bit about this because, again, I know some of you might not be familiar with this. Some of you may. But when we talk about unre temporarily unrestricted revenue, we're talking about items that you've received from a donor. Uh, and it's, the restriction is imposed, but it's, you know, it's only for a short period of time. And then after that particular period of time is over with, then it's lifted. You could pretty much use it as unrestricted. So it moves over to unrestricted when it's no longer temporarily restricted. So I'll give you an example, um, property. And that's why I say this usually relates to large nonprofit organizations. Property, uh, if, a don if a donor donate a certain amount of property to you, for a particular time period to be used for a particular thing. Uh, it could say, you know, I'll give you an example, a homeless shelter. If you're working with a homeless shelter, let's say a, a nonprofit uh, shelter that provides, you know, temporary housing for families and a donor donates to you another home. 
and say, hey, I'm donating my house to you, an old home. I, you know, it was left to me in the family. I don't need it. I think I want you to specifically use it to add a daycare component to your family shelter. So you're using the home specifically to run the daycare for the family, homeless families that you serve at your main shelter. And I want you to specifically use this as a daycare for the families in your temporary family shelter facility for the next five years. After that five years have ended, you could pretty much do whatever you want with it. What that means is after you have used that particular home as a quote unquote daycare center facility, after the five years, you and your board can look strategically to see how you could also maximize the use of that home. You might not need the entire home to run a daycare. You might just need the main floor or the main basement. And you might want to use the additional space to, to also add additional living space so it, you can serve more homeless families. So that way now it's being used to serve additional families and also a certain section is still used for the daycare. So that's what we mean when we say temporarily unrestricted. Or you all may decide, well, we really don't need that extra space for the daycare or to serve families. So you might want to just use it as an asset. So it becomes an asset and you can sell it and get the money from that and put back into your endowment or operating costs. So again, um, after that five years have been lifted, you can use the property however you wish. So that's what we mean when we say temporarily unrestricted. So that's just an example. Now let's talk about restricted. Restricted, of course, we know what that means. It can only be used for a particular program or purpose. And this is primarily grants and a particular endowment. So if we already know what the restricted grants mean, so I won't spend time going through that because it is what it is. If you get funding for a particular program, you have to use it for that particular program and for nothing else. Uh, endowments. Now, the endowment is restricted. If you have an endowment fund, your endowment was purposely used for you to raise a certain amount of money, usually a million or two. So then to, to, to help with long-term sustainability of the organization, that's what your endowment is for, to help with the capital of managing your organization. However, with that endowment, Although the endowment is restricted, you can't draw from it. You can use the interest of the endowment to go toward your operating um, expenses. So if you have an endowment, and depending on how much the interest is at the end of the year, if you have $100,000 in interest, you can use the $100,000 in interest, but you still cannot touch the million or two million in, in the endowment. So that's what we mean when we say it's restricted because you're not drawing from the endowment, but you can use the interest of the endowment. So I just want to make sure that that piece is clear. So that's what we mean when we talk about revenue streams. We talk about unrestricted, temporarily restricted, and restricted. But the goal with any nonprofit is to always go after unrestricted, but your budget needs to reflect this. In your budget, you need to show which dollars are restricted and which dollars are unrestricted. Because you will not be able to use expenses for those that are in the restricted category to do any operating type for any operating type of expenses. You cannot do that. And I'm sure your CFO or your accountant within the organization will explain this and knows that that goes outside of that's it's illegal and uh, you have to honor 
the, do the donors uh, request if they want that funding restricted. Okay, let's talk about in this budget monitoring process, budget monitoring is key to your budget management. So we talked about the budget management, we talked about best practices, we talked about the budget management process and what all that entails. Then we talked about what, what revenue streams are restricted, unrestricted, temporarily unrestricted. Now let's talk about the budget monitoring phase. That's ongoing. You have to be able to incorporate a budget monitoring process within the budget management process, I should say. And that could be monthly or that could be quarterly, but it has to be, your budget has to be monitored on an ongoing basis. So what I've done, I've put together this grid for you so I can, I can show you visually what responsibility, where the responsibility falls within the budget management process. So when we talked about your program directors, this, uh, the budget monitor, this, it, the program directors usually, excuse me, the program directors usually are responsible for the program delivery aspect of your budget and the revenue and expenses behind that. So that's for the program that they oversee. If you're over the after school program. Your, your director is giving you a budget. You need to monitor the expenses of that budget, but you also need to share with your program manager or director. This is the actual budget. This is all the revenue for this budget. We have Coca-Cola given us. We have this organization given us, this company, and these are the expenses. So this is your $25,000 a year after school budget. And I'm just throwing out a number. And, and that need to be monitored monthly. That's something at the end of the month, your program director should provide to you some type of report on what they spent that month to uh, execute that program. And then your CEO, executive director, uh, that person is responsible for the overall budget of the organization and each program. So the executive director, your CEO, that person oversees the entire budget of the organization and they should be responsible for monitoring that budget um, on a monthly basis. And that is why they need the reporting from the program directors and whomever else, the facility manager or the facility director, the person who's responsible for managing the facility. Their need, their need to, they need to get these individual reports from these particular directors so they can then look at what their expenses in those particular areas were and then look at the overall uh, expense of the organization um, on a monthly basis. So this, this has to be done on a monthly basis. This is not something that you can overlook because budget monitoring is very key because it keeps you um, on task as to how your revenue and expenses are flowing in and out of the organization. So just think about it, revenue and expenses, it, revenue and expenses are flowing in and out of the organization. So you have to be aware of that. Think about your own personal budget in your homes. You wanna make sure when money is coming in and where the money is going. And then quarterly, and this can also be monthly sometimes, it depends on your board of directors and your finance committee. But you need to be able to make sure that um, the board is well abreast and versed on the, 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 man, the financial management of the organization. Um, because they are responsible as well. They have a level of accountability for monitoring the budget as well. And that's why I share with you earlier, that's usually the responsibility specifically of the budget finance committee. But um, they're responsible for the overall management of the actual revenues expenses as well as the overall organization. And they hold the executive director accountable for that. So they're monitoring the executive director's ability to monitor the organizational budget overall. 
and um, the balance sheet. They want to see a balance sheet. So when you have your meetings with your board of directors, they want to make sure they have the balance sheet. Pretty much it's just a snapshot of the expenses and the revenue of the organization. The cash flow projections, what you're projecting, what cash is coming in. And they'd like to see all this in a dashboard. The dashboard is key because it provides your board with a very uh, analytical view of your operating expenses without all the narrative stuff. So it's just really the numbers. So if you're not using dashboards within your nonprofit, uh, organization, your board meetings with your, I think you should definitely look into putting together dashboards. Again, the CEO and the, the CEO and the CFO works directly in putting this together. So these types of things should be done quarterly, but some board meetings are monthly. So whenever you're having your board meeting, this is the type of stuff that they, they will be monitoring. So just be prepared to be able to have these uh, reports in place. So the level of budget monitoring entails, you know, program directors, CEO monthly, and then your board of directors on a quarterly or monthly basis. Okay, I also added this slide because I wanted you guys to understand that um, it is important as leaders of your organization or decision makers of your organizations. It's important to also be abreast on any types of rules or changes in the nonprofit financial management world. And uh, in 2018, the Financial Accounting Standards Board issued new rules for nonprofits. Um, and this, and according to, to this data, this was the first time that any changes have taken place since 1993. So whoever's in your organization is managing your, your, your finances as far as on the, the process side, which is your accountant or CFO, they need to be abreast on these changes. And I'm sure they are, because if they're not, then when you audit, when you are audited, the auditor will point that out. But I wanted to share this with you all because I think as leaders, you all need to be aware of this as well. So some of the changes that they made uh, centers around these four areas. And I've also listed the actual website that you can go to for additional information about this. But again, I am sure that the people within your organization that manages your, your finances are quite aware of um, these types of changes. But the first one is simplify and clarify. They're expecting nonprofits right now to simplify their financial statements to where they can clarify what their decision on any changes, any new gifts, any loss of gifts. They want you all to be very uh, clear on any types of changes around this. And um, with more and more nonprofits having different types of giving uh, programs, you got social media uh, opportunities where you can fundraise through social media, Facebook, it all becomes so convoluted. So they want to make sure that things are simplified and clarified in your financial reports uh, regarding all different types of revenue and expenses of your organization. They didn't want you to clarify any on hand and available assets. That is key. I think in the past, a lot of nonprofits have just been, you know, bulleting, oh, you know, we had this cash on hand or that, but they're not specifying where the cash came from. Is it a bequest? Is it a delayed gift? Is it a current gift? So I think they want you all to clarify the on hand assets as well, if they're available. And number three, they want to they want to make sure there's consistency in the reporting on investing expenses and investment returns. That is very key. And they want to make sure that this is specified in your financial reporting so they could clearly see uh, the on on any reporting of investments 
or expenses within your organization. And correct any misunderstandings about the statement of cash flows and related options and related presentation options. So depending on what you put in your financial statements, you, meet, you need to make sure that you correct any misunderstandings about the, the cash flow statement. So if you're if you have put something in your cash flow statements that they are questioning, you need to make sure you clarify that and you correct that accordingly so it could be documented in your financial records, whether it's your 990, your audit report, uh, but and even your annual report. Those types of things need to be uh, clarified and corrected. So any types of misunderstandings are key. Okay. So I just wanted to share this with you because I think, again, it's it's information that you need to be aware of and you need to know that these changes have already taken place. It's been since 2016, but again, um, it's just good knowledge to have. Okay, let's talk about some top accounting software for your nonprofit. Uh, Excel is a program of Microsoft Office uh, but a lot of people use Excel to run spreadsheets, to do financial analysis within their organization. So you can um, use Excel. If Excel works for you, then it works. Let it work for you. And if you have someone in your organization that's very good in Excel, that's even more of a plus. So Excel is a good option. But Excel is not an accounting software. I want to make that clear. Excel is not an accounting software. So uh, you need to make sure that you have an accounting software as well. You can export reports in Excel, but you still need an accounting software. And some of the accounting software listed is QuickBooks, Intac. Blackball, I know most people are familiar with Razor's Edge Blackball because if you have a donor tracking system, it's a very popular uh, software a lot of nonprofits use. I think it's very expensive, in my opinion, but a lot of nonprofits use it. Um, but they do have an accounting um, platform as well. So Blackball is another one. Um, Xero is another one. And then you also can customize your own system. It's totally up to you. It pretty much boils down to what is most cost effective for your organization. But I just wanted to walk you through some of these because uh, we're so familiar with Excel. And I, I explain to my nonprofit clients all the time, Excel is not an accounting software. You can use it to some degree as an accounting software, but you must understand how to put the formulas in. And if you're not that well versed in Excel, my recommendation is that you're you invest in QuickBooks and then use the function in QuickBooks to export any reports and you can put those reports in Excel. So when you're providing reports to your board and your stakeholders, you can do that in Excel. But uh, Ultimately, the decision is yours and it should be a cost effective decision. OK, so that concludes the session on board management and reporting. And again, this this particular PowerPoint will be available for a certain period of time on the Black Women's Health Imperative website for you all to refer back to. Uh, but that's pretty much, and again, I want to save your questions for the end of the complete session. But now we're going to go quickly into brand visibility. We have about 15 minutes left, and I want to kind of walk you through some of these key slides because um, brand visibility is equally important for your organization. And I want to share with you some of the best practices around brand visibility. And also re allow you some time to reflect on what you're doing within your respective organizations around brand visibility. OK, so we're going to go ahead on and get started on brand visibility. In this series, we're going to cover some best practices 
on marketing your nonprofit organization to gain brand visibility using traditional tools and social media platforms. Let me just say that um, an effective brand strategy is very crucial to both nonprofits and for-profit enterprises. And we know the for-profit enterprises, they do brand visibility pretty much very well. We see Coca-Cola and Home Depot brands everywhere, Walmart brands everywhere. But I'm not talking about just the logo, just the overall branding and um, image of the organization is pretty much everywhere. When we think of Walmart, we think of discount retail. That's a part of their brand, a discount retail store. So, uh, but for nonprofits, a strong brand can bring huge success. And I say that because your nonprofit brand speaks a little bit to the credibility of your organization, um, your mission statement. So it includes a lot of other things. It's not just a symbol. So let's talk about what a brand is. When we think about a brand, we think about something being an identifier. It tells the public, it tells your audience, it tells your consumers, it tells your constituents who you are and to distinguish you from your competitors. So we know clearly that the American Cancer Society has a different brand from Habitat for Humanity. It's an identifier and it definitely distinguishes you from a competitor. We know that Home Depot have a different brand from Lowe's. But to speak to the nonprofit sector, let's talk about the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club. They have a somewhat similar mission but they have two distinguished brands. Your brand also moves you beyond, beyond your name, your logo, and a color scheme. It is continually an evolving concept tailored to really reflect the organization's ongoing development. And I know you all can relate to, because we have seen the ongoing development of a brand like the Habitat for Humanity. If you go back to when Habitat first started out, the brand looks a little bit different. The image of the organization looks a little bit different than what it looked than than what it looks like today. Same for the YMCA. Same for the Boys and Girls Club. You know, same for St. Jude's Children. It's all these types of nonprofit big brands. United Way. Uh, so again, keep in mind that it goes beyond the name, the logo, and the color scheme. And ultimately, your brand is what people think when they think of your nonprofit. So when people is is when people think of your nonprofit that's pretty much relates to your brand. So when they're thinking about your brand they're thinking about how that relates to your nonprofit. So whatever people think about you they're thinking about your brand. That's pretty much your identifier. So that's why it's really important to make sure that you have strong brand visibility. Let me also say that a lot of nonprofits today use their brand primarily as a fundraising tool. And I'm not gonna say that that's bad, but that's not just the sole purpose of your brand. Your brand should have a broader and a more strategic approach. And again, it's your identifier. It relates to what people think about you as a nonprofit organization. So your brand is extremely key and you should be sure that you look at it beyond just a tool to fundraise or a logo or a color scheme. So let's delve a little bit more into that. Let's talk about some best practices of branding, of a strong brand. The first best practice is differentiating yourself or standing out. Your brand is to help you stand out. A good nonprofit brand helps you stand out amongst other similar nonprofit organizations and get your message across in a very noisy space. There are lots of nonprofits out there. 
All of them have great missions. Uh, so you have to be able to know that you can stand out and your brand is to help you do that. So standing out and differentiating yourself from your competitors are critical to your brand. The next bullet talks about increased trust and loyalty. When you have crafted your brand and positioned yourself in, 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 in a way to your target audience, they will trust your brand and they will be loyal to your brand. So it increases your trust and loyalty among your, your supporters, your constituents. For instance, American Red Cross, very strong brand. When you see that symbol, when you think about the work that they're doing, you know that it's a trusted and loyal brand. You would, if you're thinking about donating blood, you would want to go through American Red Cross before you go anywhere else. They have accomplished trust and loyalty within their brand. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about increased trust and loyalty. If you are going to a, um, you know, particular, let's say, let's use the Habitat for Humanity, you know, they have a strong brand and it's trusted and it's loyal. So these are, this is what associates you with a good, strong brand. So that's key. And then you want to create a nonprofit branding guide. Your brand has to be consistent. Branding must be consistent. And it's only going to, you only can build a strong brand um, if everything is consistent across the board, whether through messaging, visuals, your voice, who is your spokesperson. When we think about the National Football League, they have a consistent brand across the board. And I'm saying that because I've worked for them for 10 years and they're, everything spoke, you know, you had to be consistent across the board, even in how you produce the logo, where you use it, you know, it can't, it can't be on certain documents. It was just consistent across the board. So, but all of that was put together in a branding guide. They had prepared for us the do's and don'ts of the NFL brand. And what that meant was it was pretty much a branding guide. And it was telling you all the things that you can do with the brand, the logo, anything related to the brand and the things that you could not do with it. So having a branding guide within your organization is going to help you set the standards and the rules for how you how the people within your organization can use the brand. So that's extremely important. And it also helps you further make sure that your branding is consistent of all across all channels. So if you put together this branding guide, it's going to set the rules for not just how you can use it in print media, but also through social media. These are the do's and don'ts on how to use the brand in social media. So you definitely have to put together a branding guide. And that should be something that's done through your marketing department or your CEO or executive director could kind of give the, 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 the OK to, to the marketing department to pull something together. Uh, even when it comes down to messaging, how you articulate certain things, all that is key. So your branding guide is very e essential to, to making sure that your brand stays consistent across the board and everybody who's authorized to use your brand understands what those rules and regulations are. Okay, some best practices around a strong brand continuing. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about telling your story and appealing to the emotional. You want to share frequently about the impact that you're doing. Um, people want to know that you're doing great things in your nonprofit and they want to hear the stories. They want to be able to see the impact and the donors want to know that their return on investment is going toward the better good. So being able to tell your story and appeal to the emotion of the, the people you serve and to 
the public at large and using the data to measure your impact, that's equally important. Your brand also just speaks to the emotional side, telling your story. So if you are an organization that provides services to women in drug and alcohol recovery, you want to talk about the success stories of how those women have bounced back and they're living quality lives and um, they're, they're on the life of being sober, they're with their children. Those are the types of things donors want to hear. And being able to articulate that is all a part of your branding. Another one is your per personalizing your organization. Um, you know, many organizations, as I stated here, use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising in order to personalize and humanize their organizations and make them more relatable by having their supporters raise money on their behalf. So you want to make sure that, you know, you can relate. So personalizing your particular story, your organization particular story, uh, and why you do what you do. Habitat for Humanity does that very well. They do very well at personalizing their organization. They do it very well. Um, I would say the uh, Cancer Society does it very well also. So that's just some examples, but you wanna make sure that you personalize your organization and, 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 and you can do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, to do that. So for an example, they have the pink ribbon type of thing, and it really focused more on American Cancer Society, I'm talking about, it focused more on the research of cancer. And then they use these video clips to explain all the work that they've done in the area, all the money that they've raised. And now that they're on the brink of coming up with new research that physicians have found, and they want you to donate to that. So just making sure that it's personalized and it, 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 and it engages them in the different types of opportunities to give more. So branding, again, helps with your fundraising. And then you want to design an impressive logo. If you're working with a nonprofit organization that's on a small budget, you might say, hey, we, we don't have funding for this. And I'm going to tell you, it does not take a lot of funds to personalize I mean, to uh, develop, I'm sorry, to develop an impressive logo. That does not cost a lot of money. But you want to make sure your branding from a logo perspective is pristine and it speaks to your, your organization uniqueness. So taking some time out to design an impressive logo as well as a tagline is always a benefit to, to the organization. Um, okay. Innovate. Being innovative is very critical to your branding, being able to build a strong brand. That's extremely um, beneficial to, to, to building your brand. So you want people to be able to remember your organization for doing something different. Um, you want to be able to uh, be recognizable and you want to be able to pe be people's you know dinner conversations with their children um so being able to uh be innovative and in how you um tell your story or what you're doing in your organization doing something different other than your competitors what is very key to building the brand so i just want to make sure that you guys don't be afraid to be innovative. Being innovative is very important for uh, building a strong brand. And then we have a community outreach. And of course, this is very critical. You want to be able to know that you're out there in the community promoting your brand and talking about the great work that you're doing. Um, again, it makes you relatable. And it also uh, allow your, your supporters and donors to come alive. They see you out in the community. They know you're doing great work. And that makes them want to give more. So community outreach and getting your brand out there into the community and having a strong brand presence, all of that 
help support building a strong brand. So these are just some key best practices around building a strong, strong brand. Again, at the end of the slide, I have some uh, references. You can go and um, research a little bit more on some of the other best practices around building a strong brand. Okay, and on this slide, what I've done is I've provided you guys with some examples of some very strong nonprofit brands. And I guarantee you everybody on this uh, it, uh, that's a part of this webinar knows each one of these uh, organizations, Habitat, UNICEF, American Cancer Society, and American Red Cross. They have strong brands. They have, they tell their story. They do well at telling their story. They're innovative. They do a lot of community outreach. They stand out. They have an impressive logo. And I guarantee you they all have a brand, a nonprofit branding guide within their respective organizations. I guarantee you they have a branding guide so the internal team can know the do's and don'ts of how to use the organization's brand. So they are working within all of these best practices I just spoke about. So I wanted to give you guys some ideas on some strong nonprofit brands. And there are others out there, of course, thousands of others out there, but I know I wanted to just touch on the top four that I know you guys will be very familiar with. Okay, now let's talk about six ways to promote your brand. And this is very, uh, this list could go on and on, uh, but I wanted to be able to touch on the top six that I think all nonprofits uh, should definitely make sure that they are doing as well as um, something that I know that you know you all can can easily implement if you're not doing you can easily implement that and this is pretty much the role of your marketing department your communications department but again regardless of what size your organization is you can still implement these key ways to promote your brand so let's talk about the first one creating marketing materials every organization should have some type of marketing collateral people need to have print material to know what your organization does the mission the success uh and and talking a little bit about your strategic vision for the organization um it could be through brochures it could be a packet but you want to have something tangible that you can give people and that you can promote uh, as a way to promote what you're doing within your respective organization. Um, and this can also be done in electronic versions. You know, since we're so into this technology world, this can be done electronically as well. But most importantly, you want to make sure that um, your marketing collateral material is in compliance with your branding guide and that all your information is. Uh, presented in a way that uh, presents you in a very strong and unique light to the broader community. And of course, you can always promote through your website. Uh, that's key. And that should be consistent across the board with whatever collateral material you have put in place, your website need to be consistent with that. So again, we're talking about consistency across the board. That's very key to building a strong brand and that's one of the best practices so don't don't overlook the fact that your website still needs to be consistent with what you have in your collateral material i've worked with some nonprofits, and after leadership leaves they're still giving out old collateral material or they still have the old executive director listed on the website but that person may not be in the collateral so you just need to make sure as things change within the organization all your marketing materials or consistent. And then you want to establish partnerships with local TV and radio stations. This doesn't cost you much. If you want to get your brain out there and talk about the great philanthropic work or charitable work or uh, social services type of work you are doing to advance the mission of your organization, you need to, again, this brings me back to telling your story. You need to be able to get your story out there and talk about the great work that your nonprofits are doing. 
and establishing relationships with local TV and radio stations are very uh, key and essential to to helping build your, your a strong brand and getting brand visibility out there. So the, the Black Women's Health Imperative, uh, you know, as other health issues come up and you all are at the cutting edge of, of, of doing some great work, you will want to get on the local television stations like the Atlanta Live or the uh, Morning Rush with 11 Alive to talk about the great work you're doing or even through a public broadcasting station. But again, you have to be able to establish partnerships within your respective communities and be able to have that relationship where you can call and say, hey, you know, we're doing this. We'd love to be able to have you guys come out and, 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 and do an interview or we can come into the station. So that's, that's always key. And number four and number three kind of go together, but advertising through newspapers, publications, and journals are extremely important as well. And a lot of this can be free. Um, but if you're a healthcare organization and you're producing research, you're a nonprofit healthcare organization, you're producing research, you might want to get your publications out into some of the print material as well, uh, as well as online. Because a lot of people still use print material, believe it or not in the um, media space. So that's key. Number five talks about developing a social media strategy. With all the social media going on today, it is so important um, to make sure that this is really a part of your overall marketing strategy. A social media strategy should be a major component because social media has democratized communications. It is the communications of today uh, generation. And um, it also allows you to reach lots of people um, on a broader scale and um, create ways to build your brand. So social media is definitely something that you should be doing within your organization and utilizing it to your benefit. Because we know that there's good and evil with social media. But nonprofit organizations need to be on social media in a good, positive light, talking about the great work that you're doing and to advance your mission. And then you want to maximize the use of social media. And you could do that by, you know, doing your Facebook page, your Instagram page, your Twitter page, your LinkedIn, whatever outlets are out there that will help you promote the organization and build your brand. That's equally important. When I'm on LinkedIn, I always see posts about the great work that the Andrew Young Y is doing. That's just another way he's building his brand. He's building the brand of the organization. He's talking about the great work they're doing, the programming, the events. Again, using LinkedIn to promote the organization and to build the brand. Okay. I also thought I should share with you, since I'm stressing the importance of incorporating social media as a part of your branding, uh, as a part of to promote your brand, I also thought it would be good to kind of share with you some data from 2018 on the user base of some of the, 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 the top five social media platforms. So this goes to show you the reach of these particular platforms and how critical it can be for you guys to really get on board with promoting your brand through these different platforms. Facebook alone had, in 2018, had 2.07 billion monthly active users. Facebook alone. So if you were doing something on Facebook that you wanted to build your brand, and you wanted to promote what programs you're doing, the great work you're doing, Facebook is a great platform. We're talking about 2 billion people monthly are using Facebook. Instagram is 800 million. 800 million posts on Instagram monthly for whatever. You want to make sure you get on there to promote your good work that you're doing. And Twitter, I can't emphasize enough how good Twitter can be even if it's just your CEO tweeting something about the great work the organization is doing, or if you guys are having an event, it's good to just tweet on an ongoing basis to keep the buzz out there about your organization and to build, again, to build a stronger brand. 
And then you have LinkedIn. LinkedIn is uh, 500 million. Now, LinkedIn is traditionally a professional platform, but now more and more professional people like your executive directors and your CEOs and your presidents are using their LinkedIn page to promote the brand of their organization. So it's very important for you all to understand that that's key. LinkedIn as well. And Pinterest, I mean, again, 200 million. That's pretty good. So I wanted to share this with you uh, so you could see the power behind using social media platforms. Okay, so wrapping up this session, I want you guys to remember the keys to brand success. This is very important. The key to brand success is to know yourself, know your audience, and know your competition. And once you have these three things locked down, then you clarify, you focus, and you repeat. It's repetition. It's an ongoing process. But you have to know yourself, you have to know your audience, and you have to know your competition. Okay. Are there any questions? Nikisha, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much for that um, wonderful, wonderful presentation on brand visibility and budget management. I think we've all learned quite a bit of new information and to expand on what we already know. It looks like the majority of our guests have left. Um, I'm going to check the box to see if there are any questions being typed. I don't see any right now. Okay. So with that being said, um, thank you again for joining us. Um, these webinars will be made available on the BWHI's website in the upcoming weeks. And also, if you have any additional questions for Edith, feel free to reach out to Edith at elandassociatesllc at gmail.com, or you can email us at Black Women's Health Imperative, and we will definitely pass your information along. Edith will be touch with all attendees in the upcoming weeks as well to offer additional services around nonprofit management. Again, thank you for your time and continue to engage with us um, on social media, Black Women Health Imperative, across Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.